here. So we need to come back. Hello. Monica's moved to the other side of the room. I try to do here. That's good because I know your name. So you can start everyone. <laughs> um, all right. So. You don't notice in the rest of this room? Yeah. No, I do. I do. You were sitting over there. Yeah. Right? <laughs> but I forgot. No. Um, okay. So. <laughs> um, everybody, thanks for being here. Um, we have another incredible guest speaker tonight, and his name is Lance Lindblom, and um, I just, uh, we posted Lance's bio, and if you had a chance to look over it, you will see what an impressive individual we have here, at least on paper. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. I wish you <laughs> no, I know. I'm just, I'm leaving room. <laughs> I'm leaving room. Um, but, uh, no, but it is an incredible bio here on paper. Uh, need I uh, review here? Um, I mean, I'll just, I will say, uh, one of the things I enjoyed about meeting Lance, we met um, in advance of him coming here to speak to talk about what he might talk about. And, um, and he said, you know, I, I sort of asked, like, what, what is it that you do, actually? And he said, jokingly, I'm a bureaucrat of the empire. And, um, and then he went on to tell me many stories that proved that true. Um, and I just thought, what a wonderful job title. Um, and so uh, we have a lot of wisdom in Mr. Lindbaum here tonight. And he's going to give a human presentation. That means no slide. Um, it's actually going to talk with you. But I will actually just cover some highlights. So um, Lance is now retired, um, still on several boards. Um, but he was president and CEO and trustee of the Nathan Cummings Foundation here in New York. Um, and before that, he served as program officer at the Ford Foundation. Uh, and prior to that, he was executive vice president at Soros George Soros' Foundation for Open Society Institute. Any of these ring a bell? Yes. Yeah. Um, <coughs> uh, the McCood and J. Roderick MacArthur Foundation, um, and then some governmental positions. His background or your training is in law, right? So he's just really been on the front lines of many, many important discussions and sort of has a, a very uh, insider perspective on how the foundation world works, for sure, that he's going to share with us tonight. So please ask questions and enjoy um, this talk. Thank you. Well, what I'd like you all to do is, you don't have to take a lot of notes, okay? Put away all the... Um, Blackberries, iPhones, other devices, and we're just going to be low technology and use organic technology. <laughs> and, um, and take a look at what I hope it will be interesting, which is about social change and um, foundations. And the theories about how foundations can affect social change, but also a lot of the problems that uh, can come out. But first of all, I want to see, is, is anybody interested here in social change? Social change. I'm just wondering, what, can anybody tell me what it is? No. <laughs> yeah, where did all those hands go? <laughs> well, I, I, I'll give you my take for whatever it's worth. I mean, it's very interesting. Social change isn't caused by an app or technology, though it can be enabling or dis disabling. Social change is really the uh, redistribution of power and resources in the society. And, but, you know, you can redistribute power and resources up, down, around, and through. So if you're really talking about social change, you have to ask, what's your goal? For me, the goal, and often when I worked in the foundation um, area, was that it was to provide the maximum opportunity for individuals to develop to the maximum extent of their capabilities and abilities on the materialistic basis that the society can allow and under necessary environmental constraints. Now that's long, but essentially what that's about 
is that the individual has the maximum uh, uh, ability to really develop, educate, work, to become the kind of individual that they want to be. And um, that's, a, that's a tough road to hope. Because if you're really dealing with social change issues, you're really dealing with a situation in which, if it were only a question of ignorance or information, you know, it would be easy to solve. So why do we have such a problem in dealing with social change issues if we were seeking those kind of goals? Which usually because there's an interest in the way. <laughs> and so the whole issue is, how do you deal with those interests that block social change? Do you go around, through, over, subvert, crush? You know, how do you deal with those interests? in order to get the kind of social change where you have that redistribution of resources <laughs> and power to allow maximum opportunity to people. Now, when you're looking at trying to develop social change, I'm one of these people who, because of the generation I come from and because I was trained as a bureaucrat of the empire, it's almost like the old British civil service. And, you know, not to say that I view that as a model, I don't. <laughs> a sort of colonial model. But the people who trained for that, they had to know everything. It wasn't just a, a, a shallow across the board. They had to know the language, culture, society, economics. They had to dig <coughs> religion and history, which is really important. So you have to start using multiple lenses in order to diagnose what's the context that you're operating in, what's the landscape. In the military, they tell you it's the terrain. What's the terrain? You've got to know the terrain. You've got to know the people that are there. You've got to know the agents. You've got to know their influence. You've got to know what kinds of power they have. You need to know their motivations. And you need to know the historical context, the cultural context, and the societal context, and the economic context. All those lenses have to be placed if you're going to operate. And it's a complex situation. <coughs> As you all know, some, some of you have probably studied complexity theory. Complexity theory is a series of agents. You've got to figure out how they interact. You know, what's the motivation that's going on? And what they can do and what they can't do and what they can stop. And that, to me, is incredibly interesting. But it's also the only way that you can really sort of set the context that if you're seeking a goal in a particular area, you have to know all of that. Now again, not to use the military as, an, as a big example, but in the military they teach you terrain. You need to know the terrain. You need to know the actors. You need to know the forces against you. And what they always teach you is the best laid plans are definitely going to go awry. And you've got to assess and adapt. And all the time when you're dealing with social change, you have to have your ear to the ground, your goal in mind, and the ability to adapt. So those are sort of the basic contexts that we, uh, I would operate in in dealing with social change. Now, how can foundations make a difference in this? Well, it's in the nature of economic, political, and social systems that they commonly fall short of optimum public values. And markets fail to produce things called public goods. Governments fail to act in the public interest. Citizens fail to cooperate and pursue their common interests. Does this all sound familiar? <laughs> um, such failures are predictable. And we actually have theories in economics and sociology and political science on how to deal with these failures. And just as importantly is the nature of these failures that significant social benefit can be created by relatively small interventions, interventions that can be heavily leveraged. And that is the role of foundations, I think. <laughs> Why is that so? Well, to a much greater extent than other actors, foundations are free agents. They're not constrained by the same political, economic, and social forces that limit governments, economic institutions, and social organizations. Foundations have no imperative to turn a profit with their grants, no concern about winning elections or currying favor, and they have no need to solicit donations or to build up their membership. Thus, the failures of markets, governments, and society can really create a real opportunity for free agents with such resources. Now, let's look at some of those theories. Let's just mention them, and then I'll go through examples of them. 
market failure theories. We deal with things like public goods, which is if, it, if one person consumes it, everybody has to consume it. And you have what we call a free rider problem, which somebody cannot contribute but take the benefit of it. And that's why you have a lot of foundations about an education, which has dangerous free rider problems, and research. Like it may not be in any individual's interest to do certain research, but it certainly is in society's interest. So that's one area they can go in. The other is externalities, which you've all heard of, where somebody benefits by putting the cost off on somebody else. The major thing uh, that really shows that and illustrates that is environmental issues and environmental pollution. But markets also have competitive barriers to entry. You have certain things that the economists uh, talk about, like uh, first mover advantages, economies of scale, et cetera. But more importantly, market efficiency doesn't necessarily mean you have equity in the system or equality. Now, government failures, we could, we've all had good examples of these lately. They're not always an effective public agent. They lack, often lack analytic capacity. There's bureaucratic inertia. There's certainly risk aversion, short time horizons of politicians, and so on. Also, you have what's called the special interest problem, which is that special interests are very focused on what they want to do, and the general interest is diffuse and hard to put together. And the cost of putting the general interest together to go against a focused special interest is very costly. Then we have the failures of social institutions like collective action problems. Again, the cost of putting people together in order to push for a needed reform or a needed change. And then also, many times, the people who are most effective have the least amount of resources. So that's another place that foundations can uh, come in. There's also an information problem. Often there's little incentive to inform people. And people can take advantage of that because knowledge is power. Now, foundations are unique institutions to do this because they often sit on an endowment. And that endowment, for example, the J. Robert MacArthur Foundation that I first started out with had an endowment of like $30 million. The Soros Foundations were billions of dollars. The uh, Nathan Cummings Foundation was 500 to $600 million. The Ford Foundation got uh, $12 billion at the time I was there. These are real resources that build independence. You can be, you don't have to succumb to any political pressure. So what does that mean? Well, it means that they're substantially free agents. They can be more nimble than government, more open, more risk-taking, more innovative. Um, they can take longer-term views. They can be idiosyncratic. They can be out of the box. Um, and they can do almost anything, including fail, and without a lot of accountability. And that's really their power, is that they're unaccountable. Let's face it, they're elite institutions. A lot of times when you have family foundations, they're the last vestige of aristocratic genetic privilege, when you think about it. You know? And the problem with that is, as I often said to my friends, is that um, genetic endowments progress towards the mean. And, uh, and so you don't necessarily have smart people taking over in future generations. So you have all kinds of issues. There are elite institutions. So if we're going to have foundations, and we'll talk about whether we should have them later on, what, what can they do at their best? And their best is they can operate in an unaccountable way. If they're accountable, let's say that the boards reflected the, uh, the society that they were in, then I'd argue you might as well tax, tax the money away and have it democratically distributed. Why give it to these people to distribute? So if they have a role, if they have to take that risk-taking role, they have to take that innovative role. And um, that's not a very popular stance to take because the amount of power, even with a smaller foundation, is the amount of heat that they can take. If you can take heat, it's amazing what you can do with a small amount of resources. Now let's take a look at some of those failures and some of the things that I was fortunate enough to be involved in. Um, 
if you're able to take risks. Um, I used to do a lot of work in, in human rights. And um, one of the things, and I'll go through a few of those human rights cases, but one of the things that we were trying to do is, was well, there some way we can take a country that has a systematic failure of human rights and, and, and attack it in a more systemic way? rather than doing one case at a time, which often was some famous intellectual or some famous la labor leader why other people were being jailed or killed and never heard of. So in um, 1984, we picked um, uh, the Philippines. In those days, they had a dictator, uh, Ferdinand Marcos. And there was a dissident uh, named Aquino who we worked with to return to the Philippines and we thought with all this, these lenses that I was talking about, that he would be a catalytic power that would bring a change to, to uh, and cause a change, a political change in the Philippines. Well, we planned for his return. We worked it out. He flew back to Manila. It was covered by all the press. And what we didn't plan for was he was taken off the airplane at the airport and shot on the tarmac and killed. So, you know, he paid for that mistake with his life. So we figured if we ever did this again, we were going to do it better. So we took another example. In those days, uh, Korea, South Korea, was ruled by a dictator called Chun, General Chun. And there was a dissident in the United States who had a long history who um, was exiled in the United States named Kim Dae-jung. <laughs> So we decided this time we'll bring Kim Dae Jung to all the, this is during the Reagan administration, we'll bring him to all these editorial boards so everybody will know him, pay attention, and then we'll bring him back, but this we'll surround him with a couple of congressmen. We brought um, from Peter, Paul, and Mary, the old group, Mary went along. I mean, we tried to get every sort of like group we could to cover, you know, a few of his foundation people went, an admiral went, the ex-Assistant Secretary of State for Human Rights went under Carter. I mean, we had a whole group going with them. And so it became a big issue with the, the administration, the Reagan administration, but we wanted them to be responsible. And what happened is that we all went back with him, Kim Dae-jung. We uh, landed at the airport, and he, as we were walking off the plane, we were all attacked, and he was kidnapped. But the fact was, you know, some of us were beaten up, but to this day I'm ashamed because I was beaten up by a guy about this tall. <laughs> I could actually look at the top of his head when I was occurring. In those days I was much more macho. <laughs> um, but the, my testosterone suffered. But the, uh, the, um, but the fact was it turned into a huge international incident. And, and it turned out tens of thousands of people were marching to the airport to greet him, even though it hadn't been announced anywhere, and became a huge crisis. And as a result of all that attention, he was put under house arrest, and, he, and they didn't kill him. And uh, the good part of this story, and I can go through lots of details, is he later became president of South Korea, and he won the Nobel Peace Prize, which was a pretty good, say, twenty to $40,000 grant. <laughs> which is how much that all costs. But there are a lot of things, if you look at the context, and that's just one, where you can really make a change. There's other, we did a lot of work in Central America in the 80s where there were wars going on in El Salvador and Guatemala um, and um, uh, Nicaragua, Honduras. And because we were trying to figure out what to do because there were death squads, etc that were at work, and there were a lot of massacres going on. And one of the things we thought we'd do is we try to hold individuals responsible for what they were doing, and how could we do that? Well, it turns out that a lot of these guys, who I would call the bad guys, would go to Disneyland <laughs> with their families. So we actually had people sitting out, waiting for them to come off the airplanes, and we would serve them with subpoenas for violations of various laws, human rights laws and, and international laws. But we never were able to hold anybody responsible in the courts because often they just flew the jurisdiction. But to show you how that could really work, 
is years later, a man, a man named Gramajo, who was a, um, one of these uh, uh, colonels or generals in Guatemala who had killed tens of thousands of indigenous people during the Guatemalan Civil Wars, wanted to run for president of Guatemala. And it looked like he was just going to win hands down. And for some reason, this is my alma mater, the Kennedy School at Harvard accepted him in their mid-career program. And he was going there as a kind of to wash his reputation. And he went to the Kennedy School. But as he was going up to get his degree, we served him with a subpoena. <laughs> and it got front page news in the New York Times. He was, he was, we was, was for violation of international law. <coughs> and um, he flew the jurisdiction, and he had to lay low, and he had to drop out of the election, and he didn't become elected uh, yeah, in, the, uh, in Guatemala. And there were lots of cases that I could go through that we did like that. We had a, there was an ambassador under, uh, before Pinochet took over in Chile, and he went and was exiled in the United States. His name was Letaille. In 76, he was assassinated along with Toby Moffat, who was an aide, an American who was working with him. And we were able later to hope, find out who really did the killing, who was behind the killing, a guy named Contreras, who was head of counterintelligence in, uh, in Chile. And we sent a group of American judges down to try to hold him accountable and, the, and it was like one more week before the statute of limitations ran out. And they arrested him on the last day before the statute of limitations ran out. And he, unfortunately, he was only put in uh, house arrest, but for five years. So there were some consequences to it. But it, it put attention to what his problem was and to what the problem in society was. So there are lots of things to do like that. And we also found that, for example, at the Soros Foundation, when we were dealing with Eastern Europe and you were with a totalitarian government, say, in Poland, you know, how do you deal with that? But well, what we did is we ran underground newspapers. So there was information that wasn't the government that was getting out. One of those underground newspapers, when I was at the J. Roderick Foundation, cost $30,000 a year. Today, it's one of the largest newspapers in Poland, the Warsaw Gazette. But, it, but as a result of that, and, and also financing operations like chess clubs, debate societies, almost any civic organization that wasn't the government was tremendously subversive within those societies and really led to the kind of changes that happened in, in the late 80s and early 90s in those societies. And that was all done by foundations really paying attention. Now, when you look in the United States, remember one of the things I said, there's a, there's a uh, common cause, cost. A lot of people don't get together, you know, because it's so costly. And there's a, a focused special interest that's pushing something. Well, the first time, one of the first times the internet was used, kind of that old, but <laughs> was in the 90s, you know, early 90s, and the, and the case was, there was something called the Multilateral Agreement on Investment. I won't go through all the details, but essentially it gave tremendous power to corporations to protect their investments to the point that it, that it essentially undermined all regulation, like environmental regulation, safety regulation, et cetera, if it was going to be passed. It was going to be a done deal. It was being done under the OECD, Organization for Economic uh, Cooperation and Development in Europe. And it was a done deal. Everybody said, why are you even looking at this? This is a done deal. Well, we decided we would try to use this thing called the internet. And what we said was, well, in a democratic society, people who are affected should know about it. And we're going to use this new thing, see if we can get a discussion going. So we tried it. It was like, and I almost didn't get the grant through. It was at the Ford Foundation, because they're saying, it's like $150,000, and they say, what are you nuts? What, what can $150,000 do? Well, what this did was the internet became this connection point of people who were going to be impacted by this law, which nobody knew about. And essentially, the French cultural groups found out that Disneyland could take over their culture, 
You know, the, there are all kinds of other groups that found that they were going to be adversely affected. This tremendous thing on this thing called the Internet just organically and then exponentially took off. And then suddenly, some diplomat, somebody told me it was from Canada, actually leaked the agreement. <laughs> and so people saw the agreement, were further appalled, and it started a whole political process by which it was defeated. So, you know, that's again, if somebody's willing to take that risk, you know, you can really have, a, you can really have an impact. And, but there's heat associated with that. Now, foundations can do a lot of things. They can give grants, and I've given you an example, and I can, you know, I can give you as many examples as you like, but I did for like 31 years. So, <laughs> I mean, and there are lots of really interesting, fun, and, 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 and I think really impactful things that were done. But you can also use other things that foundations can do. They can convene. If you sit on, say, $500 million, nobody refuses your phone call, <laughs> you know, when you call up. So you can convene people, you can invite them. And years ago, some of you may remember this, we decided that the environmental movement was failing at the Nathan Cummings Foundation. So, and we wanted to get new blood involved. So we hired a couple of young guys and said, take a look at the environmental movement, make a criticism, and then we'll release this to everybody and convene people and we'll have a discussion. Well, that resulted in a paper called The Death of Environmentalism. And it was like explosive. It wasn't to kill environmentalism. It was to just to change the strategies and everything because things hadn't been improving over 20, 25 years since the early 70s. And that started the whole thing about green jobs, green investments, and a whole series of things. Just that one paper by convening, highly controversial. You know, and, but it started a discussion. So you can do things like that. Another thing is that foundations actually sit on a lot of money. Now, you're only required by law to give out 5% of that money every year. Foundation. Yeah. Foundations are required to give Yeah, they're required to give out 5% of their assets. So if you have $100 million, you're required to spend $5 million on administration and programs and things like that. Well, but what about the other 95%? Well, you can have a tremendous amount of leverage by the way you invest it. Or more importantly, what we did is we brought people to vote proxies. That means if you're a stockholder, you can actually put things on the agenda of a stockholder meeting and vote on it. So we started to do things like environmental issues to put those on the proxy and vote on them. And it resulted in environmental changes in a number of corporations who didn't like the press that somebody, some stockholders were pressing for these issues. But it led to a whole series of strategies. Remember all those lenses I talked about? Well, one of the things dealing with corporate power is we tried to have transparency on corporate contributions. So we were trying to require uh, uh, corporations to say what their contributions were. And some of the most fun I ever had was cross-examining Murdoch and um, the head of Goldman Sachs. I mean, it was, it was, it was actually fun. <laughs> but, but it was bringing up these issues. And then we did things like CEO compensation and issues like that. Well, you'd say, well, that's just symbolic. You know, these guys, they, they earn a lot of money, but it's not going to really change anything. But we've done an analysis of that. And we found out that in 93, 1993 and 94, the top five people in each company, which traded on the Standard & Poor's 500, accounted for 4.2% of the profits of those companies. Their compensation accounted for 4.2%. In 2002, 2003, they accounted for 10.4%. It also turned out that that group of five in each of those companies were a large part of the top one half of 1% of our wealth uh, distribution in the society. So, and we also knew from a number of studies that compensation, CEO compensation and high executive compensation and accomplishment and performance were unrelated. 
They weren't positively related. They weren't negatively related. They were random, despite all the studies and that they had commissioned to do. And so the result is that if we could get at that compensation, you're starting to deal with that one half of 1% who supplies the, a lot of the money in the PACs and supplies a lot of the money for the political power in the society that does a lot in defining the culture in the society and to start to try to rein that in. So there was actually a thought behind about how we attack that. Now you could also start social movements, and then I'll open it up for, for questions. Now, if um, by putting together people who never were put together before, enabling them to get together. Now there's lots of examples of that. My favorite one, in which I got into a lot of trouble, about, <laughs> was in 1999, Seattle. And if, for those of you who don't remember, it was about the World Trade Organization. There was tremendous demonstration in Seattle that sort of brought the World Trade Organization onto the uh, agenda for the first time. And the reason why that was important is because of some of the mechanisms and processes in the World Trade Organization were trumping national safety laws and environmental laws, et cetera. And people just didn't believe it. In fact, in those days, Ralph Nader said, would make this case, and people thought he was crazy. And he offered $10,000 to um, any congressman who read the act and could answer three questions. And he would give $10,000 to uh, charity. And one congressman, who was a Republican, read the act, and he answered the three questions. And he and Nader gave $10,000 to the guy's charity, and the guy promptly voted against the bill because nobody really read through these thousands of pages and realized what the impact was. Well, what we did was what we enabled people that had never talked together to get together. Labor, environmentalists, trade people, social justice people, and they're the ones who really formed that coalition that really brought all these points to the fore. Now, we can also go, if you're very, if you, if you have, you're not afraid, and when I was with the J. Roderick McCarthy Foundation, we supported a lot of litigation. So we sued the FBI, we sued the CIA, we sued the CIA on a case I don't know if you've ever uh, seen the movie Conspiracy, and there's a guy who talks about the MK Ultra experiment. That actually is real. And it turns out there was a Canadian uh, uh, doctor who had a institution where he would take people who had uh, neuroses or wanted to stop smoking. He would put them to sleep for two or three weeks and they do psychic driving experiments. So they would record why these people were in these drug-induced comas, do not smoke, do not smoke, do not smoke. Well, it turned out that he turned a lot of people with neuroses into psychoses. And one of those happened to be the mother of the head of the New Democratic Party in Canada. So we brought a lawsuit against the CIA. And as we were going up the steps, the CIA settled the case because they didn't want to get into it. If this sounds familiar, if you've ever seen the movie Manchurian Candidate? <laughs> <laughs> this stuff is this stuff is like real. And and so but they settled the case, uh, which was too bad because of, we wanted the publicity about it, but it, but they paid them so much money and you know they couldn't refuse it. So but you could bring those kinds of cases, you know, and develop institutions. That would, uh, that would hold people accountable, watchdog institutions, things like Human Rights Watch, which started out as Helsinki Watch. It was just European because they were being criticized as just being a tool of the Cold War. They suddenly became America's Watch and Asian, Asian Watch and all these different watches until they became Human Rights Watch. And so they were more general. In those days, you could actually embarrass people if you showed that they were violating human rights. That embarrassment sort of stopped. I'm afraid that strategy needs to be, be looked at. But anyway, those are all. So we built an institution um, called the National Security Archive. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. But it's about the declassification of papers. And that was started when somebody came to me 
Scott, Scott Armstrong, who wrote The Brethren and, and a whole series of other books. Um, and he was involved in the, uh, the original um, Watergate investigation. And, um, and uh, another reporter from the New York Times. And it turns out they both were doing books on Central America in those days. And one had stored all these documents that he had got from the Freedom of Information, from Freedom of Information requests in his attic, the other in a garage. And they realized, just talking over beers one day, that they had the same documents. So they started to compare them. But they realized they had been censored differently. So they decided, they asked for grant money to put them together to see if they could get a more complete document. And that was the start of the National Security Archive, yeah. which is now a huge institution today. And we would give them money while a lot of the bigger foundations stepped in. In those days, I was with the J. Robert McCarthy Foundation to do litigation, which wasn't that expensive. And it was the club that allowed them to get the documents. So you could set up this symbiosis. So there are all kinds of things that you, that you can do. And, 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 and if you have the ability to take risks, and, and you want to. In the old days, there, there used to be a lot of noblesse oblige with foundations, and eccentric ones. I was fortunate enough to be with a lot of eccentric ones, because it gave you the possibility of using that money eccentrically. But you, but you also had people who had some noblesse oblige. But nowadays, there's uh, not very much oblige with the noblesse. I think. And, and so you don't even have that. And that's one of the problems that we can talk about in, in, in our discussion. <clears throat> there are lots of examples that I can give you of things that were very exciting to do. And um, I should just end before we really open it up with ethical prescriptions. Um, we did a lot of human rights work in the, in, in the various foundations I worked in. And we made it a point that we would never fund anybody that, to do anything that we ourselves wouldn't do. So we, um, so often we would go on missions ourselves with our grantees so we could see what the risks were and everything because people really did get killed. And, um, and we lost a lot of people, especially in the 80s and early 90s. Um, and then later, even at the Soros Foundation, we lost people in Czechia and, and other places. So we would run those risks to see what they would do. That would be our ethical prescription. So it's very easy to sit in an office and say, OK, you go do that, you know, and, and you're on the line. But it was just the, the thing that really sort of inspired me when I was first getting involved in a lot of these issues. And we'd get involved in very controversial things, the Arab-Israeli issue, defending Palestinians, and, and, and getting um, Jews out of Ethiopia. I mean, just all kinds of things. And um, when people were always trying to stop you, and um, especially the American administration would often try to stop us in those days. Um, but as I was going through with one woman, and we were dealing with death squads, and I used to go around <laughs> trying to deal with death squads in several countries. And in this particular situation, it was in Guatemala. And we were. Um, they used to kill people and then dump them in the, uh, in the uh, trash, you know, in the trash yards and, and garbage. And, and you'd go in the morning to try to identify them and get them out. As we're going through, I was talking to this one woman, and I said, you know, you're, you're running a tr terrific risk here. This is really terrible. I said, I, you know, I look at these people, and some of them we knew. And I said, I don't, what did they do? And the first thing is she looks at me really quizzically and she says, Lance, you're such an American. She said, they don't have to do anything. There's no cause and effect here. Okay. And then the second thing I said, well, you're running such risk. You know, you're running risk for your family, et cetera. You know, I don't know if we can ethically, you know, support you doing this. And she, and she was later killed. But she looked at me again and she said, oh, you are such an American. She says, you don't understand. It's not that we'll win. But I have the privilege of fighting. And that means everything. And I think that really moved me. 
And I realized in all the work that I did across um, a number of countries that there was always somebody who stood up. There was always somebody who stood up. And you know, they could be rich, poor, middle class. It, it, it was across the spectrum. And if you ask them why, why they were doing it, why they were running the risk, they didn't give you a big philosophical you know, uh, essay. They would look at you like, no, it's, it's like wrong, duh. You know, and and you just you know it, it just it was very clear. <coughs> it was very clear. Anyway, all of these things are things that foundations can do. And um, I don't want to bore you with lots of stories. So if you if you have questions, or we open up and we can talk about some of the problems that foundations have created too. I'd love to talk about. Sure. So that was going to be my question. I, I think it's easy to be surprised by the power of foundations because they work behind the scenes, but are they all benevolent? And when they're not, what recourse? Well, that's that's the key question. Let me give you an example of an old case, an example of a new and some new problems. An old problem. Not many people know, but the Carnegie Foundation, which is very famous, right, and, and supposedly good guys. Mm -hmm. They actually financed a poverty study in the 1930s. White poverty in South Africa. That poverty study and the people involved turned out to result in the Nationalist Party and their policy of apartheid. Now, I'd say that was a failure. Okay. Another example, a lot of people um, um, talk about Gates and his work with vaccines and things like that. There are a couple of things that, um, when you have somebody that's so powerful, Gates probably accounts for almost half the philanthropic uh, assets now in the country, which is extraordinary. There used to be more pluralism. But with half of that, he can have a tremendous influence. So he was under criticism for one point, and, and, and where we used to debate, is that he would go into Africa and have these vaccines, and he'd vaccinate a village. But he would have tremendous investments in a refinery right next to the village that was poisoning the vaccinated people. So we're saying, you know, why don't you use your investment leverage, because we were using it, to really, to really maybe change this? And they were saying, oh, well, you know, how do I know I could change it? You know, because you oh, you have $880 million worth of stock. I think they'll take your phone call. You know, and so they weren't willing to use that that leverage. They had that bifurcation. If you look at one of the areas that he's in, you know, where an area that's getting more and more controversial is in the education area and the so-called educational reform. The original reform, the original. <laughs> when you say so-called. Well, I'm very skeptical about it. If, if anybody's really interested in this subject, Diane, do you know who Diane Ravitch is? Yeah. Okay, Diane Ravitch was a neoconservative who has like changed 180 degrees. Used to work as assistant secretary for education in the Bush, um, the second Bush administration, and um, um, she just wrote a book called *Reign of Error*. That is an excellent book if you're interested in school reform. It just came out, and it's it's a devastating book. And she just like totally has changed her mind about school reform. But the first reform that Gates wanted to do. If, if you remember, was to make high schools smaller. They decided that small high schools were going to be better high schools and more productive, and, but they were going to keep a lot of data and, and everything. There were a number of people who said, wait, 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 there were real issues with that, but they really weren't listening. It was sort of the best and the brightest, which is another great book written by David Halberstrom back in the 70s, 80s. It's about Vietnam. It's how the best and the brightest can lead you into a quagmire when there's no accountability. Okay, and there's no accountability here. And when you're that big, you can really affect the whole ecology of something. So they made these high schools smaller. Now they didn't experiment. They went to scale, what we call the foundation world, to scale. Everybody wants to go to scale as fast as possible. Well, the result was two years in, you could, I mean, I saw the data, it was clear that it was a failure. Why? Because when you made the high schools small, they didn't have economies of scale. They had to get rid of AP courses. They had to get rid of after-school activities. 
they had to get rid of a whole thing, a bunch of things like that because they didn't have the material base to push it. And, and the result, to their credit, but it was five years in, they admitted it was a failure and stopped. Well, we learned something. However, they truncated the lives of 200,000 students in the meantime. And that, to me, is, is unethical. Okay, they should have piloted that before. Now you have school reform, which is basically being pushed, which is the testing, um, evaluation of teachers based on tests, and a whole series of um, activities that are more market-based. And um, we're now just getting into a, the fight about whether that's effective or not. And there are a lot of people saying that really isn't effective. If you look at the big models where people do really well, you know, in schools, you'll find out they're Finland. This is like Finland. They have an entirely different model. They don't test their kids. They have a lot of recess, you know, and things like that. There's not a lot of homework, but they score the highest on tests because there's more equality in the country. It turns out when you take those international tests that you compare countries across the, uh, the spectrum on things like math, reading, and science, the U.S. I don't know scores 26th or 31st. We got Shanghai scores first, or Finland scores first. Scandinavian countries are pretty high. Taiwan and Korea are pretty high. But what they don't tell you is they also determine the um, the poverty levels in schools, and that if you take American schools where there's 20 or 25 percent or less of poverty in those schools. They have to actually score one and two on those tests. So it's an issue, it's also an issue of poverty. It's an issue of equality. And, but that's a harder issue to deal with. So often there's an attempt of foundations to find these little tactical bullets to solve huge problems when they really are huge problems that need to be solved. That's a long answer. To yeah, but where is the accountability? Well, there isn't any. It used to be the accountability used to come from pluralism. Okay, so if you have if if you have a number of foundations, like even a foundation as large as the Nathan Cummings Foundation, I couldn't do a lot of stuff, or we could start something, but if people didn't see results or they didn't like it or whatever, they didn't they didn't come on board, and I you had to convince people, you know. So there was always that accountability that other people were looking at it. And all that. If you get, you get, uh, and the school reform is really financed by three foundations: um, Gates, Eli Broad, and um, the Waltons. Not the TV show. No, not the TV not show. Not the TV. store. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, I probably show my political approach. I know you like pretty well and stuff. But if I saw that kind of funding alliance, I'd be afraid. I'd yeah. be very afraid. <laughs> I mean, there, there's ideology behind that. And, and that's one of, the, one of the things you really have to watch out for. The difference now when you talk about accountability is we used to look around for people who, who could operate in the areas that we were in, and there was there, there, it wasn't that there was no hubris. There's always hubris. It's easy to sit on money and you know be very wise and funny and and, and all that. But you, um, you, the hubris quotient people sort of tried to check, and and so you gave money to people to actually try to figure out what to do. So other people were figuring out what to do and sort of reporting it and, and trying it out and stuff. Now there's a huge model where people go and say, this is what you do, I want you to do it, and I'm going to hold you accountable for doing what I want you to do. And that's, and the, and that's less accountability. Plus they're huge. They can put a huge amount of resources. You've got to remember, when somebody comes in with a billion dollars, which is what Gates and these guys can do, they can, they can, that little tail can wag 500 billion public money because it's discretionary. And institutions nowadays, because of budget cuts and everything, are desperate for that kind of money. So they will they will really bend things in order to get it. 
So that little bit of money, comparatively, though it's a lot of money, can wag a lot of tails and, and wag the whole dog. The other issue is you hear these a lot of ideology about private-public partnerships. It sounds really good to a foundation person because I can leverage government money. You know, that's a lot of money. But think about that. You're having a private in group determine what the priorities are, what the approach is, with no democratic accountability, and you're using public resources to do it. It's a very dangerous situation. There should be real checks on it. But it's being touted as a major ideology now within the foundation. foundation. Another long answer to your yeah. Anything else? I can tell you more story. <laughs> so basically you're saying the foundation world has a 1%. Well, yeah. You, you know, I always say that it always amazes me when people say, I don't understand why foundations don't do X, Y, or Z. And part of it is, you've got to figure out where the money comes from. Okay, it, does, it doesn't come, you know, the major money comes from, not the top 1%, it comes from the top, you know, quarter of a percent. And those people have, uh, they, they have certain perspective. There are eccentrics, there are exceptions. I mean, I'm not determinist about this. But, they, but they'll have an approach. So the approach may be hold teachers accountable rather than create more equality in the society or work on a redistribution of wealth within the society. They won't take a more system, you know, systemic look. And if you want to look at it, it's very interesting. There used to be on major foundation boards a few labor leaders, like the Ford Foundation had one during the Cold War. Um, and once the Cold War stopped, I don't think in the top 100 or 200 foundations there's a labor leader on the board. There are lots of corporate people on the board. I was at the Ford, and I'm thinking that you're not uh, recording this, but when I was in the Ford Foundation, I had to go in front of corporation heads and talk about corporate accountability. And there were six presidents on that, of, of corporations on that board. And I was essentially going up and saying, you're doing a lousy job, we need to hold you accountable. You know, you can imagine how happy they were. Well, what, what do they have to say to that? They don't. They, they don't say Well, anything. they don't have to say, right? They don't. You're met with sort of silence. Mm -hmm. In that particular case, one of those people was uh, the head of Xerox. Mm -hmm. If you remember, he did a nolo contendere, mm -hmm. which means that he didn't he didn't admit his guilt, but he was he, because of the compensation issue in which he was uh, uh, he was accused of accounting fraud essentially, to boost his compensation and stock price, okay? And essentially, he did a noble contendere, which means I'm really guilty, but I'm not going to admit it. Um, but here's the money back, okay? He was on that board. He was, he was refused. Part of the settlement with the government was he could not be on a corporate board. And he was still on the Ford Foundation board. Now, because of sort of low-key pressure, that came in, he finally resigned. But that, but that's the kind of thing that goes on. I mean, I found that outrageous, you know. Um, but that, you know, you you can't be deterministic about it. But it was like um, when we did the proxy work, which is the stockholder work. We literally put trillions of dollars together to bring these stockholder actions. It was always interesting the foundations that wouldn't do it. And they always had corporate people on the board because essentially it was a, they hate stockholders, you know, because they're holding them accountable. That's their accountability. And, and, and it's not even mandatory. If you vote and get 100% of the vote, they don't have to do it. It's embarrassing if they don't, but they don't have to. Um, and that's why a lot of them within the stockholder actions, we not only brought CEO compensation issues and, and environmental issues, but we also dealt with corporate governance. We found out that uh, boards are staggered. Their elections are staggered, so you elect one third of the board one year and another third another year. Well, that turns out to make them very unaccountable. So we ran a campaign in which we've gotten almost, I think, 150 boards now, because we've had huge votes, to change that so they're all elected at the same time. And that increases the accountability, or actually studies to show that that you know, reduces, uh, that increases profits and everything 
to distribute by 4%. That's how much unaccountability even just cost in a corporate sense. So there are those kinds of actions that you can take. Yeah. Um, not super knowledgeable about the foundation world, but my understanding is a lot of the large foundations that we know of are typically like industrialist founded foundations like Rockefeller and Carnegie. I'm wondering if there are, if you've seen changes over time and have any expectations about now that a lot of the largest companies are tech companies and if like Google Foundation and various foundations are sort of either changing the priorities that those type of people have who are now sort of tech sector people versus not simple making things people and how that might shift priorities well, is, and yeah. actions. There is some, there, there are a couple of shifts that go on. They went when the, the tech people came in and there's some really good tech people like Skull, Skull Foundation. He was eBay. Um, he set up a $600 million plus foundation. What he does is he tries to deal with certain issues by investing in films, for example. So he did Syriana, Fast Food Nation, et cetera, things that show a social issue in a commercial film. Um, and um, so he had a different approach. He also, but a lot of them like the social entrepreneur approach, and that's a whole other discussion I know for some time. But when you emphasize the individual so much, you know that it's like the individual is a hero. They're the ones who it was Zuckerman, you know, it was all. That's really not true. It's really a team of people, and so you got a lot of people who are sort of pressing the social entrepreneurship model. And yeah, I think it's stressing, you know, stressing the, the wrong things. They call it venture philanthropy mm -hmm. and things like that. But I've seen it over the years, and I've seen the cycle if you're in it long enough. And when it goes, it starts to change. That cycle starts to go, and it, and, and it becomes much broader than, than, you know, just emphasizing the individual. Mm -hmm. but, there, but you do have, like, a mid who has given a lot of money He's, he's dealt with trafficking and stuff. The trouble is, what I used to say about them when I worked with the Ford Foundation, I mean the uh, Soros Foundation, you say the power of the Soros Foundation is it can turn on a dime with a lot of resources. So it's very nimble, okay? Its weakness is it can turn on a dime <laughs> with a lot of resources. <laughs> because a lot of times it's the that head, the entrepreneur, it becomes, if they decide, oh, let's try this, suddenly the whole thing shifts. There's not a process. And I'm not saying there needs to be a lot of bureaucracy, but it's like if you're in the Navy and you got to turn an aircraft carrier. You know, you've launched your plane, and here you're going you're gonna to turn the aircraft. But you have to worry about recovering your planes, and you, know, and you have to worry three miles in advance how you're going to turn the, you know, the ship because it takes a long time to, to turn the ship. And so, you know, you have those kinds of issues. So it's not a lot of a lot of tech people got very wealthy very quickly, and you know they just think it's that that's the model. Mm -hmm. And um, it's the same thing with hedge fund people and investment people. You know, they're used to figuring something out, making a bet, and pressing a, a button, and then waiting for the result. You know, but that's not how anything works. That's not. You know, like how manufacturing works or anything socially works. You know, you've got to be more inclusive about that. And you've got to figure out how it impacts people as you do it, because you need support from people. Otherwise, it's top down. And that's, and that's the danger here. And that's the danger we've seen in some of these, in some of these actions, is you have top down. And I, I realize now, back when, when, um, when I was first starting out, there was a lot I thought I knew. And um, uh, the more I did it, the more I realized, and it's an old, vain old cliche, that I didn't know. And I realized there was a lot of things that were really important that I wasn't paying attention to. Because I thought a culture, if a culture in my mind and my values was atavistic, it wasn't important. Yeah. But, it, but, it, but it actually is important. And, and and actually it may have some benefits. And so you have to you have to have a broader a broader <coughs> view. Yes. Um sort of on the note, I guess 
I was wondering if you might have an insight into the main differences between like venture capital and foundations. So like what would incentivize someone to, I mean it, from what you said it seems like venture capital people sort of decide what they want to do and they put their money to it and let people get to work. Whereas you sort of encourage and sort of create like sort of open source information and Try. sort of growth um, from the ground level. But um. Yeah, if you have any insight on something. Well, no, I mean, a venture capitalist, right, takes a portfolio and they invest in, say, 10 things. You know, they expect seven or eight of them to flop, one or two of them to be kind of okay, and one to really, you know, hit the bell, and then they're really wildly successful. You know, foundations are a little like that, or they used to be a little bit like that, but the, the, you have to do it as on a pilot basis, on a small scale basis. You know, so you're trying something because the difference is you have like consenting adults in the venture capital situation. All sides are sort of consenting to the risks and stuff that are being taken. Often within the foundation world, when you're dealing with the social and political and economic <coughs> and cultural context, things are impacting people that they don't have anything, any say about. It. And that's a danger that you have to, that you have. so in that way I think it's different in what the things are that you're balancing and so on. And, and, and it's harder to determine what a success is. It's easy, I mean, when I was doing business stuff, I thought it was easy because, I mean, not that it's easy, but it was easier because there was a number at the end of the day, there was a number. You know, I looked at that bottom, you know, audit, and there was a number. Mm -hmm. It's much more complicated in the in the social sphere. I mean, even with social indicators and things, how do you judge success? How do you measure things? And often we don't think that aren't measured don't count. And it's very difficult. I find the whole measurement routine that's going on here. You know, I'm a firm believer in social indicators and stuff, but the whole measurement. Uh, uh, attack, what it does is it narrows your scope, makes it more and more narrow because instead of figuring out how to measure the important things, we just do the things that we know how to measure. And that and that can create a very, very narrow scope. Water oh, thanks. <laughs> Anybody else? Before, before I stop, I just want to uh, read something. Many years ago when I was in graduate school, um, this is before I went to law school. I was at uh, the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton taking an international degree. And there was a guy who taught there named Marion Levy, who was a great professor. He was a sociologist. He's written several books on modernization. Very dry. <laughs> Very dry. But he actually was quite insightful. And when I knew him, he had Levy's Nine Laws. And after I left, he added two more. And when he gave me those laws, I thought this guy was crazy. He was an old buddy. He didn't understand change. I had a very romantic view of social change and, uh, and how you did it. And over the years, um, I found myself coming back to those laws, which are, which are laws that he calls Laws for the Disillusionment of the True Liberal. And I'd just like to read these to you and just think about them. Because some, when I first heard them, I was just like, God, this guy is like totally irrelevant. <laughs> um, the first one was, large numbers of things are determined and therefore not subject to change. Hard to accept, especially when you're young. But I think there are things that are really determined. You have to work around them. Two, anticipated events never live up to expectations. <laughs> Three, this was the hardest for me to accept. That segment of the community with which one has the greatest sympathy as a liberal inevitably turns out to be one of the most narrow-minded and bigoted seg segments of the community. And there was a corollary to that, which essentially is, last guys don't finish nice. <laughs> Four, which I thought was incredibly insightful. Always pray that your opposition is wicked. In wickedness, there is a strong strain towards rationality. Therefore, there is always the possibility, in theory, of handling the wicked by outthinking them. 
Corollary one, good intentions randomize behavior. Subcorollary one, good intentions are far more difficult to cope with than malicious behavior. <laughs> Corollary two, if good intentions are combined with stupidity, it is impossible to outthink them. <laughs> I found that to be really true. I always played that the adversary was evil, like follow the money or something. I mean, because then you, you knew what motivated. Yeah. But when somebody's good intention, yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, five, in unanimity, there is cowardice and uncritical thinking. Six, to have a sense of humor is to be a tragic figure. Seven, to know thyself is the ultimate form of aggression. <laughs> Eight, no amount of genius can overcome a preoccupation with detail. Nine, only God can make a random selection. Ten, eternal boredom is the price of constant vigilance. And eleven, which I found is really true after being in the foundation world for a long time, nothing is so suspect as altruism. <laughs> now, when I first heard these, I thought, oh, my God, this guy. But you know, in a lot of ways, they really do open up. You have to know wow. what you can change and what you can't change. And you have to know what the motivations are of adversaries and, and why they're blockage. And even though foundations are great independent entities, in a lot of ways, they're becoming more narcissistic and narrow and plutocratic. And so we have to think about what their roles are. I thought in the past, it would fulfill the role that I was talking to you today about, which is innovative risk takers, et cetera. But now they're doing less and less of that for a variety of reasons. There's still eccentric ex eccentricities out there, but not a lot. Um, I'm just wondering, now that you have retired, congratulations. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what, now that you, can have, you are able to step back and have perspective on your 31 years in foundation, <laughs> um, do you propose a system of checks and balances for partnerships, for foundations in general? Do you advocate for more transparency and, you know, accountability? Or are you just kind of like, you have to be done, I'm done. You know, <laughs> resolving and hang and out? Um, um, and also, I'm curious about uh, competition among foundations and when foundations start behaving like corporations. And just that, I think that's an interesting thing to talk about. Well, those are all great questions. I mean, the part of the thing is, is I struggle with the, the role of foundations. I think that if we keep foundations, they need to be smaller. Meaning you have to put a maximum size on a billion dollars or two billion dollars. Who's going to tell Gates that? Well, I'd love to. <laughs> <laughs> There's a project. Yeah, right. Retirement. But the, um, but the other thing, but you can break them up into a whole series of foundations. The other, that way you have at least the check of pluralism. The other thing I think you have to look at is, you know, is how do you get more independent board members, uh, especially on family foundations. I think that, you know, in 1969, which was even before my time in this, they, um, they had a great reform act, and they found that foundations, um, that families were using foundations to hold corporations in perpetuity, control corporations, because they would use the foundation, the corporation, family corporation as an asset for the family foundation, and, and foundations can exist in perpetuity. Well, they changed the rules that you had to divest after a certain period of time, so they stopped that. But when I think about it, I think the foundation should probably sunset after a period of time, and not like 50 years after the founder dies, I think sooner. And it used to be that way. When I first started with foundations at the end of that, 1980, it used to be that you had to pay out 5% of your assets or your or the income you earned, whichever was higher. So that basically was going to result probably in the spending out of the foundation over time. That rule was changed under Reagan to just 5%. And so you can remain in perpetuity if you do good, you know, if you're good at investing. I, but I think there needs to be a taking a look at who's on the board of these things. And I don't mean that it should reflect the community. I mean, I, the trouble with reflecting the community, that's government. That should be government. If you want to go there, which I'm not against, in fact, sometimes I lean that way, you should just tax the money and let the political process distribute, distribute the money. 
and then it would be more democratically accountable. Uh, but if you think there's some role for foundations, you need to look at that kind of family control over time and how long they, they list. There's an article by a woman uh, named Joanne Barkin in Descent Magazine that just came out that talks about some of the reforms, if you're interested, um, you know, that she proposes for foundations, which are quite, you know, they're not major, increasing some taxes and things like that on them. She also wrote in the previous issues some great articles on the education reform movement and critical to it. Excuse me, what's her name again? Yeah. Uh, Joanne Barkin. Barkin. And it's Descent Magazine. Don't like that. Yeah. It's an old uh, Michael Walzer, who's a philosopher from Harvard, started in the 50s. He's still around. <laughs> but it's a good it's a good magazine. It's sort of a social democratic. But it's it's fairly really high level. I mean, high you know it's high quality. Not as well known. If you've ever seen the Woody Allen film where he goes into the future, wakes up in the future, and he you know he discovers things like smoking is good for your health, stuff like that. <laughs> he has this discussion about uh, the the there was a merger in the future of two magazines, uh, Commentary, which is was a right magazine in Descent, which was considered a left magazine, and the two were merged to form dysentery. <laughs> <laughs> can we sue the government? That's what we will. I already asked him. You already asked him? You can sue right. the government. It depends on what you sue them for. for wasting our money? No. During the, <laughs> during, um, during you, the you usually, the you usually sue them on due, due process mm -hmm. or violations of certain civil rights or discriminatory stuff. You used to be able to sue the CIA mm -hmm. and the FBI. I have a lawsuit right. against the FBI, um, and uh, which is a whole other story. <laughs> but the uh, um, the during Reagan, at the end of Reagan, they stopped the ability to sue the CIA. And that's because there a group of us in foundations brought a lawsuit against them for the Army, I think it was the Army, and the CIA were doing experiments uh, with LSD. Yes, I remember. And they gave them to this guy unwittingly who was in the Army. And he, depending on who you believe, jumped, was pushed out of a nine-story building and died. And his family never got the straight story. So we were suing wrongful death. And that's when the Congress passed the law that we sued the CIA. Wow. Um, if you go into, if, in Britain it's worse because we, there used to be, uh, there was a number of cases, I'm trying to remember, Spy Catcher was the book? There was a book called Spy Catcher. I used to bring in copies from the United States into Britain because it was banned in Britain. <laughs> but it was, um, people feel that often. And, they, and uh, it turns out that you not only couldn't sue MI5 and MI6, they didn't exist as legal entities. <laughs> which is what, it turns out that we were just talking about the NSA didn't exist. Right. People didn't know until Bramford right. wrote a book called The Puzzle Palace. Mm -hmm. Which is also very interesting because we got into a case because of that book. Um, because once he wrote the book, he wrote the book from documents that were in the Marshall Library or something. And the documents he used, the CIA stepped in and classified the documents in this library and took them away, you know, after he wrote that book. Um, but that was the first sort of acknowledgement that such an agency even existed. Nobody, you know, it wasn't mentioned. It was all black, what they call black budget and stuff like that. So, you know, there, to answer your question, there are a lot of ways that you can sue the government. But there are a lot of ways now that you can't, that you used to be able to. <coughs> we just have to figure out how to vote now. Yeah. I guess. <coughs> Any other? I had a question about yeah. something you said right at the beginning, Lance, about um, there's usually an interest in the way. Mm -hmm. And you can go around them, you can subvert them, you can go over them. And it feels like that's part of your expertise is assessing um, what the interest is that's in the way. 
thing, and then how to best tackle that. Can you give an example of identifying an interest that was unexpected or you know something that suddenly kind of came clear, and then the way that you handled it? And I'm asking because. Um, I think it takes a lot of experience and maturity, in a way, to see those things. And um, and sometimes when you're really just gung ho to change something, you can be optimistic or you can be idealistic and not sense when there's an interest in the way. So maybe just a, an anecdote. Well, you'll find out. Yeah, I mean, they're they're thing. not subtle. <laughs> <laughs> when they present themselves. Sometimes they call you up and say, "Where are you living?" <laughs> 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 The, well, there's a lot of examples. One I can think of a very long time ago. Um, there was a uh, something called Polartica. So there was a um, the uh, there was a guy in Paraguay, a doctor, who worked in poor areas, giving his donating his doctor skills. He was a Catholic, and he and the government under Strassner in those days, who was a dictator, had been there for many years. Um, didn't like this guy, thought it was very subversive. So they picked up his son, tortured him, and killed him, and dropped him on the doctor's doorstep. And um, uh, the family, you know, of course, was shocked and, and grieving, and this was in, in Paraguay. But it turned out, to make a long story short, that the guy who did it, this army guy, lived down the street from them. And they don't know how it happened. But the um, postman delivered a postcard to the Filartica family instead of to this military officer who it was addressed to that said that he was in the States and where he was in the States. So there was an old, I'll get to the point about the interest in a second, there was an old statute of, of jurisdiction in the federal law that was done in the 1790s that essentially said that if you had impersonum jurisdiction, if you had jurisdiction over the person, you could bring an action against that person if they violated international law. Statute had never been used for jurisdiction. Nobody can really figure out why it was there. I think it was there for pirates. I think, you know, pirates come in and you could get them because piracy was against international law in the 1790s. <clears throat> well, somebody brought a case, the Center for Constitutional Rights here in the city brought a case saying that torture this guy, tortured this guy, and that was a violation of international law. The torture was an international law, against international law. Well, the U.S. and the State Department had been very much um, asserting sovereign immunity which means that you can't sue the government, you can't sue people, we're not going to accept this kind of jurisdiction for years. So that was the interest that was in the way. The way they got around it was, and the way every, we, we thought about getting around it, was that was when the American diplomats were kidnapped in Iran. So the U.S. was trying to make a case that this was, this was a violation of international law. So they wanted to emphasize international law. So there was a push on the State Department saying, well, you, you've got to support international law. You've got to support this case. And to everybody's amazement, Carter decided to put in a, a brief um, supporting the Philadelphia case. Mm -hmm. So that was one way of getting away around an interest in which it was essentially, that's a co-option. Mm -hmm. And that established torture as a violation of international law, which was later put into our statute, not that they're being enforced. Um, but um, and and he and there was a case brought against Florida. He was found guilty, and um, he flew the jurisdiction. And he, there's still a huge judgment of millions of dollars against him. Uh, but that's one example. There, there's some examples where you just try to overwhelm an interest. For example, the interest in the way of the uh, of supporting the World Trade Organization. There were um, in 1999. Uh, Clinton decided that, at near the end of his term, that maybe there were some problems with the World Trade Organization, that he needed special provisions in the treaty about environmental um, laws and labor issues and things like that. 
and a bunch of us were called to the to a, a White House meeting to talk about this because a number of us had been pushing for this. And it turned out they they said, well, we're going to try to do this, and we were saying nobody's going to believe you. You know, you're not going to you're going to run into a buzzsaw. You know, it was kind of power play issue, but it was all done very diplomatically and stuff. And they just didn't believe it. And the result was there were all the demonstrations and everything in Seattle, where there were 50 or 60,000, which for Seattle was a large number of people, that essentially shut the WTO negotiations down. That's where our interest was directly attacked mm -hmm. and, um, and blunted some of it, but, but not all of it. But that was an attempt to confront something head on, sort of almost by you know, street demonstration actions. So there, you know, there are those kind of there are those kinds of issues. Often we found, for example, in the stockholder actions when you're dealing with interests, that we would try to make the case that it was a win-win situation. And often once you got into the boardroom doors and you started laying it out and they were actually listening, they got it. And so you got a lot of people near the end of my um, stay at the Nathan Cummings Foundation, we would 50% of the stockholder actions we brought were settled. And that was because you built a reputation that you were going to stay with it, that you weren't crazy. You know, we didn't put on rabbit suits or anything. We went in the courtroom and we spoke the language and they and and they would settle the case because they could see that it actually would be to benefit for them. So they're all kind of, I mean they're all and sometimes you just sue the hell out of them. You know, that's a whole nother approach which was done. So you, do, you have to make decisions, and there are sometimes I found the most frustrating cases is that case that that first rule from Levy's laws, where there's some things you can't change, and you got to be careful not to wreck your resources on the rocks of things that you can't change. And I don't know about you, but that's the hardest thing for me to accept, you know. And and you you have to choose, you know, all the banal stuff about. It. Choosing your battles and everything is really, really important. And it's very important, I think, to be precise about what you're doing. That's why when I was talking about what is social change, everybody says social change. You know, if all the power goes to the two people, that's social change. And you know, the question is, what is your goal? Yes. That's the most important thing. And, it's, and one thing, too, is technology can help. Technology can eliminate a lot of transaction costs, but technology is not the answer. And technology is a very important tool and sometimes can open up things. I remember I was having this discussion with somebody, I was sitting on a panel, and somebody was saying, oh yeah? Well, what about the Arab Spring? And what I said was, yeah, what about the Arab Spring? You know, immobilize people, then what? You know, look where we are now. I mean, you need organization. You need things that back it up, that people act in a coherent and, and coordinated manner. And that means sometimes giving up some stuff individually. It's not an individualistic thing in order to make those kind of structural changes. That's also very hard. And it's a different, it's a different sort of culture. And, um, and that's why when people talk about social innovation, it's important. I and mean, in the, in the internet, for example, has done a lot of tremendous things. Also, done a lot of bad things. It's segregated people into you know their own little bubbles and has uh, increased the ability to manifest yourself politically, while it's undermined social solidarity. And once you, and when you, when you undermine social solidarity, you have a real problem, even though you may be politically more active with various groups all pushing for their for their view. And that's why we get the kind of stalemates we have um, partly in, in Congress. I think. So you get, it's a it's a mixed bag. I'm not opinionated. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody hears you. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else? I have I have one okay. easy question, maybe a final question. Um, so you have won uh, a lot of awards, and um, I think that uh, I'd like to know if there was one of those awards that actually that really meant something to you. That um, I mean, 
that that maybe hopefully they all do. But you do you know what I mean? Something that really uh, we were very proud to receive or honored to receive or humbled to receive. But you were you know, the awards I felt very fortunate. But they they came mostly at the end. You know, it's like okay, the old guys don't give them <laughs> it's part of the process <laughs> to get them out the door. <laughs> um, and and you, and you do feel humble and, and, and everything. But I have to tell you, and, and this I learned a long time ago um, from a personal basis. I mean, it's hard to believe that I once, all I wanted to be was a naval officer. <laughs> and I got out of the south side of Chicago, you know, on a scholarship to be in the Navy. And once I was in the Navy during the Vietnam War period, I saw what was going on and I resigned my commission. And that was a, that showed me you know, that there was there was real issues. Suddenly, my world was totally upset because it was like, I didn't even comprehend this. I mean, I knew what I wanted to do and all that. The reason why I say this is, and I used to say this with my staff all the time until the point that they threw it at me, you know, the throw stuff at me, is that if you do the right thing, nine times out of 10, it's gonna be really controversial. You're gonna really tick off people. You know, interest will really come after you. That's how to sort of how you, how, how you can judge how successful you are <laughs> in some ways. And that your rewards are in heaven. You know, you have to you have to take your rewards in that you feel and you're listening to people so you're not, you know, just some egomaniac. But you're that you feel like you're doing the right thing. That's where the reward has to come through. So as much as I'm really happy that people, that it was very nice of me to do that. And it gives you a chance to speak and say whatever's ticking you off at the time. Um, <laughs> but that, uh, um, that's not important. And you can't go for that. You know, that can't be the motivation. I mean, and believe you me, you'll be going through, especially now, you guys are going to be going through careers that are going to be going like this. And, you know, you have to, you have to be defining yourself internally you know, with values and things like that. Never, ever define yourself by a job. Take it from someone who's had about seven or eight of them. You know, after a while, you can't. You know, you have to define yourself by what you believe and what you do and how you help people, you know, what your impact is, you know, authentic things. And uh, again, that sounds banal and trite, but I think it's, it's, it's really true. And it gives you that strength because there will be terrible, there will be bad times, and you and and hard times. I mean, I I remember uh, suing the FBI and getting all these threats and and all that stuff. And during that time, it's very difficult. It's difficult when your family to you see your family under that kind of stress and 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 pressure and phone calls and stuff like that, or dealing with some of the Israeli stuff where you get phone calls. But but. You know, they really rose to the occasion. They were really, you know, surprised. But you've got to be prepared for that kind of stuff. It's never, if you're really into social change, when you're redistributing power and resources within the society, you know, that's not going to be popular with some very powerful people. <laughs> and, and you're just, you're just going to have to be ready for that. I actually found it, it was in doing these things that we've talked about, and unfortunately, as I said, I can tell you a million stories. To me, it was incredibly interesting. It was that part that mostly these guys were kind of evil, <laughs> and you could outthink them. And the fact is that if, with little resources, you could fight somebody with a huge amount of resources. And to me, that was like, how, you know, how can we do that? And that's the art of it, and that's the interesting part because you can see, and, you, and when you see the impact, you know, and and that. You know, if people are walking in the face of the earth because of some things you worked on with other people, I mean that's an incredible, you know, reward, and uh, it allows you to do a lot of things that you know you never thought you'd get a chance to do. I mean, I got to be able. We would negotiate prisoner exchanges with Castro. I mean, we went in and got uh, uh, gorillas out of El Salvador. And brought the head of the Rebel Alliance in El Salvador in the United States <laughs> to talk, you know, to try to say this guy's not a, you know, some horrible guy. He wasn't one of the guerrillas. He was a political alliance. It's a lawyer. 
And um, you know, some of that stuff all helps in the process. In, in that case, for peace. And and that kind of you know, those are the rewards to make the bottom line to me that you know maybe maybe I'm helping a little bit. Sometimes when you and it's worse when something bad happens. You know, you work with somebody who dies or is killed. You know, that's hard to deal with sometimes. Thank well, thanks. Thanks for having me.